So most of you know I wasn't here last Sunday. Uh, Kelly and I took a cruise uh, to Alaska. Uh, we uh, left from Se- thank you. We left from Seattle, and, um, and so uh, two Sundays ago that afternoon we flew out and uh, and we were in Seattle a day before uh, we got on the the boat. Um, well, when we got to Seattle, uh, this is what we saw. Uh, the, the air, the sky, is just filled with this fluffy white stuff flying around. And it's on the bushes, it's on the cars, on, it's on everything. And we'd never seen anything like that, so we started asking around, what, what's all the, the fluffy white stuff? Well, it turns out that it comes off of the cottonwood trees this time of year. And it, it comes off in abundance. It's everywhere. It turns out it's the seed that uh, the, the tree produces to uh, replace itself. Now, if you talk to people about the, the cottonwood uh, fluff in the air very long, you'll start to hear people complain because they say they're really allergic to it. People will tell you that, that it's just terrible this time of year. Their, their allergies to the cottonwood is just terrible. Uh, but I looked it up on Google, which is the authority of all things, <laughs> and it turns out that nobody is allergic to cottonwood, that that's a myth. That actually, at the same time that cottonwood is producing this fluff that everyone sees floating around in the air, that other trees and grasses are producing pollen that people are actually allergic to. They're allergic to what they can't see, and they blame it on what they do see, right? What they see is the thing that captures their attention. What they see is the thing that becomes most important. Isn't that interesting? How often do we do that, even as people of faith? And maybe it's a thing that we blame, you know, or, or maybe it's something we give credit to. Maybe it's the thing we see that we place our trust in, our belief in, our hope in, our confidence in. Maybe it's in something that we can see or t- taste or touch or hold or measure or count or feel. And yet, Scripture over and over tells us stories less about what we can see, taste, touch, and feel and more about what is unseen. I mean, just think about that passage I just read. It it begins by talking about an invisible, unseen God who created everything that exists out of nothing. Everything we can see, taste, touch, feel once didn't exist. It was nothing. He, he He talked about Noah. One day God shows up to Noah and says, I want you to build a big boat. And he says, what's a boat? Because he didn't live near the water. He said, a really big boat and I need you to go get animals and fill up the boat because it's going to rain. And so he builds this huge ark, even though there's not a cloud in the sky, a boat you can see, a reality you can't see. It talks about Abraham and Sarah, who an unseen God speaks to and says, I'm going to be your God now. He hadn't been previously, I guess, and said, I want you to leave this land that you know, that you're familiar with, and I want you to go to a land you've never seen before, and there I'm going to make you into a great nation. I'm going to give you children that will outnumber the stars in the sky that I mentioned they were too old to have children. A reality that they couldn't see or imagine. Or there's Moses who led the Israelites wandering in the wilderness for 40 years until they could settle in a promised land that they had never seen for themselves. Over and over we have these stories in Scripture of, of people who followed and obeyed a God they could not see to do things, to go places that they had never seen for themselves, realities that they couldn't possibly have fathomed. They did it in faith and obedience. And so it says in verses 6 through 13, all these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. If they had been thinking of the country they had left, what they knew, what was familiar, what they had seen, they would have had opportunity to return. 
Instead, they were longing for a better country, a a better reality, a a place that was only possible through faith, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. All of these are examples of faith, what it means to live by faith in, in believing putting your trust in, putting your confidence in something, someone that we cannot see. And so we begin with the definition, 11.1, the Hebrews 11.1 says, faith is the confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. That's a traditional definition of faith, confidence in what we hope for, assurance about what we do not see. But I actually like, that's the NIV version, I actually like the Common English Bible version. And I I checked the Greek, and it's actually, I think, more accurate. It says, faith is the reality of what we hope for. Did you catch that word? The reality of what we hope for. The proof of what we don't see. Did you catch those words? Reality and proof. I mean, oftentimes when we talk about reality and proof, we're, we're talking about things that you can scientifically prove, things that are measurable, touchable, seeable, tangible. They're saying that's what faith is. Faith is evidence. Faith is proof. Faith is certainty. Faith is reality. Sometimes I think when we use the word faith, it sounds to me like like we're talking about optimism. You just got to have a little faith. Or we're just talking about, you know, hope. Don't give up hope. Keep the faith. Well, there's nothing wrong with optimism, and there's nothing wrong with hope. But when the Bible talks about faith, it's talking about something a bit more substantive, a bit more concrete, a bit more gritty. It's using confident words like reality and proof. So faith is, even when we don't see it, even when we don't see the one who is calling us, even when we don't see the reality he's calling us to, faith is the proof that we act on, we stand on, we move on. And so 1 Corinthians 13, 12, I, I think defines faith also by saying, now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then, someday, we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. I mean, that's the reality of this life, that in faith we only know partially. We only see partially, like in a, in a mirror that's kind of hazy or foggy or, or, or unclear. We, we see it, but we don't fully see it. I mean, the truth is that when God speaks to us, often God speaks in in nudges, and impressions, and and in whispers, and we certainly can't prove it. Even when I'm confident God has spoken to me, I can't can't prove that God is the one that said it. I might just not have had enough sleep last night. Or maybe God spoke, right? Or sometimes we, we talk about the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Maybe I just feel guilty. Or maybe it's the Holy Spirit. Am I going to choose to live by faith or am I going to rationalize, right? We, we don't know what the outcomes will be. We, we don't know what the future holds. Most of us don't even know what the, t- this afternoon will be. We have to live our life into the unknowing of what life will bring. And so we live by faith, not by sight. We are confident in the realities that we cannot see, yet we know to be real. 2 Corinthians 5, 6, and 7 says, We are always confident, for we live by believing and not by seeing. I just love these words that they're using connected to faith. Faith is confidence. Faith is reality. Faith is evidence. Faith is proof. Martin Luther King defines faith as taking the first step even when we don't see the whole staircase. You ever, you ever have that happen in life that, that you just, you just got to take that step of faith, that leap of faith, even though you don't know what's going to happen? That's hard to do. But if you have faith that this is reality, you know, it becomes, um, I'm not going to say easier, <laughs> it becomes more confident. 
So I mentioned that Kelly and I uh, went on this cruise uh, last week. Uh, we boarded the ship, uh, Carnival Legend, on uh, May 22nd, uh, along with about 2,000 of our closest friends uh, for the week. Uh, we, and, I, and I think that, that my experience was pretty much the same as everybody else's, just by observation. I, I, when they called our group, we, just, we got on the boat. Um, I, I didn't have an opportunity to inspect the hull for leaks. Um, I, I, didn't, I didn't go down to the engine room to make sure that it was fully functional. I, I didn't get to check the gas gauge, if they have gas gauges, to see if we were uh, fueled well. I, I didn't get uh, a chance to, to sit down with the captain to find out his experience and his training and to review his resume. In fact, I never even saw the captain or that, that part of the crew. I just, just, you know, just got on the ship and I trusted their ability and the ship's integrity to take us out into open water and to handle whatever storms might come and to get us to the ports that we have been told we would go to and back safe and sound. I just, I just trusted it, right? Um, every day I, I got up and went to the Lido deck and then later to the, to the dining room and I ate food prepared by people I don't know. I, I, didn't, I didn't interview the chef to make sure that he and his workers were qualified to prepare the food. I didn't inspect the kitchen to make sure it was clean. I didn't check the dates on the packages of the food to make sure the food wasn't, you know, spoiled and expired. I didn't to get to Seattle, I got on two jumbo jets with my wife, my precious wife, right? I didn't even meet the pilot to say, are you, you know, are you wide awake? Have you had enough coffee? You know, what is your training? I didn't, I didn't get to walk around the plane to make sure it seemed fully functional. I did it four times, two there and two back. Is that foolish? Right? We just, I mean, I just assumed, like, it, 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 you know, it, it looks good, the ship looks fine, the airplane looks fine, they, they do this all the time, well, it should be fine, and it was. Isn't that interesting how much we put our faith, we just, we just assume that, you know, the, 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 the ship will work, the plane will work, the, the captain knows what he's doing. I, I'll, I'll jump on my motorcycle and get up on the sawgrass and go 80 miles an hour, assuming my bike isn't going to fall apart underneath me. Is that crazy or what? Right? Yes. <laughs> How often in this life do we put our, our safety, our security, our confidence, our hope, our trust, our, our faith, I'll use a word, in things of this world. I just want to know, do we have that same level of confidence, trust, faith, belief in God? Do, do we have enough faith to, to trust God and what God has told us in His Word? Do we have enough faith to obey God, to do the things that God has called us, told us to do? I mean, who do we ultimately put the most faith in? God or in science, technology, medicine? God or money, the economy? God or people like doctors and politicians and our spouses and militaries? God or our stuff? Our bank accounts, God or laws, God or jobs, God or our friends and connections, God or education, God or my health, God or airline pilots and ship captains. Who do we ultimately put our most faith and trust in? And scripture is pretty clear that no matter how rich or successful or popular or well connected or healthy or anything else that we might trust in, God is bigger, God is stronger, God is better, God is a bigger reality. Deidre Riggs writes, God is the author of all new ideas, images, and concepts of objects that we cannot see with our limited mortal senses. Even when we stretch our imaginations to the furthest reaches, we have not stretched far enough. The Bible tells us that what God has in store for us has not even entered into our consciousness. 
So I mentioned Moses earlier, this 40-year uh, journey that he went on with the Israelites. And, and there came a point in the journey where Moses makes a request of God. He'd, he'd heard God's voice, but he says, God, now let me see your glory. I want to see your glory. Show me your glory. What he was asking for is, God, I, I've heard your voice, but I want to see you face to face. Now, that's an unusual request because in, in biblical times, they understood, they knew that to see God face to face meant you would die. That because God is holy and because we are sinful, even somebody like Moses, that the difference between God's holiness and our sinfulness would be fatal. And so God responds to Moses, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you. But you cannot see my face, for no one may see me and live. There is a place near me where you may stand on a rock, and when my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft in the, ro a, in a cleft in the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will remove my hand, and you will see my back, but my face must not be seen. Did you catch that? God, my request is that I see your face. He says, you can't handle my face. No human can handle my face, but you, Moses, I'll let you see my back. And you're going to have to live with that. And I think that is the reality of this life. We will see God one day face to face, but the reality in this life is, on rare occasions, some people get to see God's backside, and that's a great thing, but most of us won't even get that. That we have to live with faith in unseen things and an unseen God. That ultimately faith is not the feelings we get from our, from, from our religious experiences. That, that, that faith ultimately is not that goosebump you feel sometimes in, in worship. That faith ultimately is confidence in a God when none of that is available. When our circumstances aren't even necessarily going that well. Faith is ultimately believing without seeing. Jesus once said to the Apostle Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. So a life of faith requires a deep conviction that, that the invisible spiritual realm is every bit as real as what we can touch and see, and even more real. In fact, Jesus said that everything you see, everything in this world ultimately will be eaten by moths and, and eaten by vermin and, and rust and rot. It won't last. That only things in reality that will last are heavenly realities. The only treasures will be the treasures of heaven that will endure. And so here's where I, I want us to just think for a moment. I, all of us believe in God. We, we have a faith in God or we wouldn't be here. You'd have other things you could do this morning. But faith isn't just about believing in an abstract God or, or a set of religious convictions. Ultimately, we're talking about a relationship with an unseen God who created everything that exists out of nothing. Faith in that kind of God is faith in the possibility of a God that will get involved in your life and actually maybe ask things of you that you don't want to do, make demands of you that you would otherwise like to avoid. Right? That kind of God might actually ask me to live by faith, not just have faith, live by faith, walk by faith, obey by faith, give by faith, serve by faith. That if I'm actually going to have faith, confidence in who this God is, that he's going to ask me to speak and act like his son even when I don't want to. That he's going to call me to a higher commitment and loyalty to his kingdom than the kingdoms of this world. To tithe on my income even when it's scary, I don't have enough money, to trust that he's going to provide my daily bread. To love my enemies even my enemies on Facebook. 
that he's going to expect of me my total allegiance, my total allegiance, to love him wholeheartedly with all my heart, all my mind, all my soul, and all my strength. Faith is the reality of what we hope for, the proof of what we do not see, reality and proof. Renita Weems writes, only when we risk getting lost do we find our way. Only when we stop trying to see our footsteps does our pathway become more certain. Encounters with God take place when we set out in a direction we hadn't planned to take and are willing to give up going where we intended to go. You can be sure that wherever the right place, the appointed place is, it is forward. One step ahead where you cannot see out in the deep water. There. See? Of course not. You won't see until you go. You won't see until you go. Why does any of this matter? Friends, because the God you and I claim to have faith in is much bigger than any of us could ever imagine. And the God that you and I claim to have faith in has plans and intentions for you and for me and for our lives that is bigger than anything you and I can conceive or imagine. Are we going to have faith in God as a concept? Or are we going to serve, obey, follow, go? For an unseen God that we have proof, we have conviction, we have evidence, because faith is the proof of unseen things. What would it look like in your life to live by faith? What would it look like to live by faith? So I I wanted to share with you this morning one of my favorite prayers by one of my favorite authors. His name's Thomas Merton. He was a writer and a monk. And he wrote this prayer. I thought maybe we would say it together. He says, I have no idea where I am going. I do not see the road ahead of me. I cannot know for certain where it will end. Nor do I really know myself. And the fact that I think I am following your will does not mean that I am actually doing so. But I believe that my desire to please you does in fact please you. And I hope that I have that desire in all that I am doing. I hope that I will never do anything apart from that desire. And I know that if I do this, you will lead me by the right road, though I may know nothing about it. Therefore will I trust you always. Though I may seem to be lost and in the shadow of death, I will not fear, for you are ever with me, and you will never leave me to face my perils alone.